It's the Hear Me Now podcast. I'm Sean Collins. Glad you're listening. This is our last episode of 2023. And when we go through our notes and look at the stories that have garnered headlines this past year, the tales of both human achievement and tragedy are writ large. As we debated whether the pandemic was over, ongoing tracking of COVID ended in many states, and long COVID made headlines month after month. Oregon became the first state to okay the use of hallucinogenics like psilocybin, and we saw its use in treating complicated grief. The GLP-1 receptor agonists like Gozempic and Trulicity and Bayetta are said to change the game in the treatment of obesity, heart and kidney disease, and type 2 diabetes. We saw the mainstream rolling out of artificial intelligence in healthcare. The first use, chatbots. RSV treatments became available. The respiratory illness can be deadly in children and older adults, and its treatment has dogged scientists since the 60s. Ongoing deaths from fentanyl and other opioids continued. Narcan, the overdose reversal drug, was approved for sale over the counter. In the wake of the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, chronic organizational stress led to unprecedented burnout and job abandonment by nurses, physicians, and other healthcare professionals. We've seen continued focus on issues of healthcare equity. Gene and cell therapies get closer to the market, making CRISPR technology the next medical buzzword. CRISPR is just one technology leading to unprecedented breakthrough treatments for people with sickle cell disease. Roe v. Wade was overturned by the Supreme Court's Dobbs decision, inaugurating a new era of debate on access to reproductive health care. Pediatric gender dysphoria was legislated in state capitals around the country. And in this year of remarkable advances, perhaps the most noteworthy breakthrough was FDA approval for new treatments for Alzheimer's disease. And Alzheimer's research is the subject of today's program. We're pleased to welcome two leading Alzheimer's researchers and an author who's been writing about Alzheimer's for the last 20 plus years. Dr. Stephen Salloway is founding director of the Memory and Aging Program at Butler Hospital in Providence, Rhode Island and a professor of psychiatry and human behavior and professor of neurology at the Warren Alpert Medical School of Brown University. Dr. Salloway, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Welcome. Thank you, Sean. Appreciate the invitation. Dr. Rudy Tanzi directs the Genetics and Aging Research Unit at Massachusetts General Hospital, director of the McCants Center for Brain Health at Mass General. Dr. Tanzi is professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Tanzi, welcome. Thanks. Pleasure to be here. And David Schenk is a national bestselling author of six books, including The Forgetting, Alzheimer's, A Portrait of an Epidemic. He served as a senior advisor to the Cure Alzheimer's Fund and advised the President's Council on bioethics on dementia-related issues. He's also an old friend. David, welcome back to the podcast. Such a treat to be back with you, Sean. Thank you. So anyone who's read newspapers has noticed headlines over the past year or so that indicates that there have been what appear to be remarkable advances in Alzheimer's research. And I want a little bit of a reality check from those of you who are seasoned researchers here. What should we make of that? Dr. Tansy, let's start with you there in Boston. Well, I, I, the, the big advance is for many of us who have been convinced that beta amyloid, the material in the plaques in the brains of Alzheimer's patients cause this disease, it's great to see a drug that hits those plaques, hits the amyloid, and it was uh, successful in a clinical trial. The genetics always predicted that. The, the genes that we discovered back in the 80s and 90s all said amyloid causes this disease, but many trials failed that were targeting amyloid. So to have a trial that provided the proof of concept that hitting amyloid is beneficial is just great. It's great for the field. But 
the problem is, and we can get into this later, uh, hitting amyloid in a patient who's already symptomatic, uh, it, you know, in my opinion, I'd like to hear Stephen's opinion, it's just too late. It, we got to do better. We need drugs that are that we're going to be able to use for the masses uh, before they have symptoms. I, I like to say amyloid should be hit in Alzheimer's the way cholesterol should be hit in heart disease. And we don't diagnose Alzheimer's until the equivalent of with heart disease, you already have congestive heart failure or certainly coronary artery disease. And at that point, you wish you took Lipitor or some type of statin cholesterol drug 10 or 20 years before. I think that's how to think about amyloid. Great breakthrough. We still have to do it earlier. So we're going to need safer, more affordable drugs to do it. But this is a great start. Dr. Salloway? Yeah, I agree with Rudy. I think we're at a turning point uh, where Alzheimer's will increasingly be viewed as a treatable disease. And this is the first step in that that there, we can diagnose it increasingly earlier and we can institute treatments to either slow it down or prevent it. And this is the first one and Rudy already, you know, gave caveats about its limited benefit, but there is a benefit, which is good. Uh, and we gotta do better and we gotta go earlier and we have to have treatments that are more widely available than this, this is gonna be a, challenging to administer to a large number of people and hopefully eventually treatments that are uh, either oral or can be given infrequently to a large number of people without too much expense. Um, mm -hmm. So I think we're just at the dawn of a new era. That sounds hopeful. Finally. I mean, and Rudy and I have been at this a long time. We can tell you yeah. how many years, how many studies, how many projects. Yeah. And I guess, say, Stephen, you know, there's, there's those folks I know who never were swayed by the media hype that, oh, amyloid's the wrong target, amyloid's not the right thing, just because people were debating it. You know, you have to realize the reason why people weren't believing amyloid caused the disease originally, because, and, and again, look at the genetics. The first gene we found, I, I, I discovered it as a student, uh, along with others, when I was at Harvard. That was my PhD thesis. I named it APP, amyloid precursor protein. It's the protein that makes the amyloid. The second two genes, the presenilins, were the enzymes that cleave the protein to make the amyloid. The fourth one, APOE, is the protein that clears the amyloid from the brain. Yet, given all that evidence, people said, no, it's not amyloid, because when they put these genes in mice, the mice didn't make the second pathology that kills the nerve cells, the tangles. They never stopped to think, wait a minute, can mice even make tangles? Guess what? They didn't have the right proteins of this protein called tau to make the tangles. So there was debate for, for a decade, over a decade and a half based on that. And then finally, when we created the first human brain organoid of Alzheimer's, and put amyloid in with human neurons in a brain-like environment, bang, amyloid tangles. And so I think that to me, you know, I think we're on the right track now. Like I think it, Stephen said exactly right, this is the dawn of a new era, but it, we gotta do so much better. It, it's, it's just, we have proof of concept, it's a great breakthrough, but, and I totally agree with Stephen, we need small molecules, little white pills you can take in the morning that are immensely cheaper and safer that we can use the way we use cholesterol drugs for heart disease to prevent Alzheimer's in tens of millions of people in this country right now. Yeah. It's intoxicating to think about a statin-like approach to being able to stop a disease process that's so damaging and rips so many families apart before it begins. I mean, that's a remarkable dream. Well, it's, it's Sean, it's a requirement because if you really look at the the curve for heart disease, where we've made great progress in slowing down the impact of morbidity and mortality. It's from a combination of prevention, statin-like drugs and good heart health and you know good healthy lifestyle, uh, but and then acute treatments. When someone does have an occlusion of a coronary artery, we can open it up uh, and we need both. And same thing for Alzheimer's. We gotta be able to prevent it early and as Rudy said, this disease goes on for years, decades before their symptoms are really noticeable or, cons or persistent. And we get a lot of time to intervene uh, and get in there earlier. And so 
that's our challenge. David Schenk? We're listening to two of the of the great minds in this field. And um, it's just a pleasure to, to hear this. And I, I can't wait to hear more. The to, to kind of put it in layman's terms is someone who's been following the science from the outside for almost 25 years now. It does. I, I, I just want to second and third the the that this thought that we we have turned a corner. We've crossed <laughs> we've crossed a, th- a threshold. There were it, we've had a lot of really brilliant minds working on what may be the most complicated disease ever, uh, ever to, to that human beings have ever faced, and um, and it's not. It, we, we there have been a lot of discoveries over over the last several decades, but now now that we have a couple of uh, of, of drugs that are actually treating the disease, albeit in, you know, just tiny, tiny steps. It feels like, and, and because we've had some proof of concept that Rudy started to describe there about amyloid, it feels like for the first time we have the um, justification to actually have hope that we can stop this disease. And so what I want to explore, at least in part in this conversation, is how much hope can we allow ourselves to feel? Can we actually see the end and start to describe what that might look like? And is it, as Steve just suggested, is it two different things? Is it three different things? Is it, half, is it a dozen different things as we discover this disease? There's a lot of different types of diseases. Uh, but let us kind of you know, acknowledge that hope and explore it uh, for ourselves, because I think the hope itself gives new energy to the will, the national and international will to stop the disease. Yeah, I think that's a really great tack for us to take in the conversation. So the hope that David's describing, Dr. Tanzi, Dr. Soloway, um, how much hope are we going to allow ourselves to have? i am uh, never had more hope in my life. I mean... I, you know, I, I work with a, a foundation that David's worked with as well, the Cure Alzheimer's Fund. And I had to give a talk to their board uh, this morning. And this was after our researchers, like really an A-list of Alzheimer's researchers, yesterday had a brainstorming session. And one of the things that came out of that brainstorming session was so simple, so simply put by Randy Bateman, who's one of the top Alzheimer's researchers at Wash U St. Louis. And he said, look, everything I've learned about this disease, and he's been studying the early detection, early biomarkers of this disease, imaging biomarkers for as long as anyone, is the faster you accumulate amyloid in your brain, the sooner you get Alzheimer's disease. Okay? That's the elephant in the room. And so I, had a, I wanted to explain this to the board members, so I made a, some slides this morning to show them where I have a sink overflowing with water. And I said, this is the brain overflowing with amyloid. How did you get there? The tap could have been leaky or the drain could have been clogged. Once that water overflows, what happens? Well, in Alzheimer's, the amyloid causes tangles. In the house, the water is going to cause electrical short circuits and little baby fires to start to spread. And then those little fires suddenly start engulfing the entire house. That's called neuroinflammation. By the time we diagnose a patient right now, the house is already burning. It's not just a short circuit in the wall. It's not just a bulb that water got into. So just put it in that regard. To help patients right now, you've got to put that fire out. But to prevent this disease, you have to take a, you have to go to that sink and make sure that drain is unclogged and make sure that tap isn't isn't leaking and that's the way we're going to st- so and we have all, I, I have a drug that turns off the tap it's, it's going into clinical trials after 25 years next year others have drugs that can more cheaply clear the amyloid than the current antibodies that at least provide a proof of concept so yeah i'm extremely optimistic about the next 5 years or so I think the biggest thing we have to do is really take Alzheimer's out of the darkness. So there's always been this feeling that Alzheimer's is sort of an inevitable part of aging. 
There wasn't much you can do about it. There's no urgency for diagnosis. The, the treatments aren't really meaningful, the ones we've had for a while. And so doctors and many patients and many families have just tried to ignore it. And obviously it doesn't go away by ignoring it. It's just a major league problem. And we've got to bring it out into the light. And then I think that's what some of these breakthroughs. So we talked about the new antibodies that lower amyloid. I think a really exciting development are blood tests that can detect the buildup of plaques and tangles well before symptoms. That's going to be much easier to administer than PET scans or spinal taps or other tests that are more expensive or invasive or hard to come by. So uh, that's a big breakthrough. And those are just coming into the clinic. And the other critical element, and that's why I'm so glad you guys are covering this in this podcast, is getting the public engaged, which that, I think that's going to happen. I'm not worried about that because the public is really concerned, is getting primary care doctors engaged because that's where patients go and that's where they seek advice for their health. And they need good advice from their family doctor. And I think I know there are real challenges there because family doctors are so stretched. And when you put cognitive difficulties on there, that adds a whole component to a visit that they just don't are just not budgeted. It's not, you know, so we have to figure out how to do it, how to provide the care. But it's critical that primary care doctors um, and the public, all of us really get engaged. And the only reason we're at this point with these breakthroughs is we've had so many great research. We've had great researchers like Rudy and many others, but we've had thousands and hundreds of thousands of study volunteers around the world who, you know, put themselves on the line to test these new development, to make these developments possible. I think Stephen's saying early detection, early intervention is the way forward. We can't wait for the brain to deteriorate before we diagnose the disease. David Shane. Yeah. Question for Rudy. You're, you're, you're very hopeful about this early intervention. Do you think that we're going to get in some period of time, and it, it, maybe it'll take years and years to get the right drug that's safe enough, um, or maybe it'll, a hand, it'll be a handful of different drugs targeting people who have different you know, chemistry, but will we get to the point where we can actually intervene in enough people using that statin model so that the reality of Alzheimer's that gets to the to the to the middle, you know, to the stages, the symptomatic stages, it'll that'll be a rare thing, and we won't we won't have to even spend that much energy in treating it because it'll be so rare. Or do you think that we're going to have to put just as much energy, always, even after we get that drug that does the early intervention, into some, into different drugs that that tackle it at those later stages? So the current breakthrough with the antibodies, the that the immunotherapy against amyloid, is if that, if that was heart disease, you're waiting to have coronary artery disease, and now you're trying to clear the plaque from the arteries. But damage has already been done and is ongoing, like inflammation in the heart. So it's better, it's good, and it's, and it's helping, like I said, incrementally, but wouldn't it be nicer if you truly had a statin that never let you get to the point of coronary artery disease. Never mind the fact that we don't diagnose the disease today until you have the, if, of Alzheimer's, until if it was heart disease, it's the equivalent of congestive heart failure, <laughs> almost. So, I mean, things are moving along. When I started in this field, I did my first genetic study of Alzheimer's in 1982, and we had nothing. And then we got Aricept and Namenda, and like, it was better than nothing. At least you're starting to treat the symptoms, you're helping people. And now here's the breakthrough. We have something that at least helps clear the plaque. And so logically, you're going to say, well, how about a drug that doesn't let the plaque even get there? And Stephen mentioned these biomarkers, the blood-based biomarkers. Yeah, we have blood tests that can tell you you have amyloid in your brain. And I don't know what you say, Stephen, but some people who study this stuff say that if you ask how many people in this country have amyloid in their brain right now, but don't yet have symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. I've heard estimates anywhere from 10 million to 40 million. So that's a lot of people that you're gonna to wanna to start treating with early detection, early intervention. I wanna treat before they have the amyloid. That's coronary artery disease and heart disease terms. And Randy Bateman says he has biomarkers. He, he can use the current biomarkers to tell you who's five years away from plaques. 
So you don't have, by imaging a blood test, brain imaging a blood test, you don't have amyloid yet, but you're, you're on your way. And so for people with two copies of APOE4 or the early onset familial mutations or even Down syndrome would have an extra copy of the amyloid gene. That then you treat, you start treating, you don't, you don't wait, you start treating. So if you have a drug that can turn off the tap, turn down the amyloid production before the brain's full of amyloid, that's the next step, right? So one next step is try to get rid of the amyloid more safely and affordably than the antibodies. But even going beyond that, turning off that tap, stop the amyloid from even accumulating early on. And then we're really going to put a dent in this disease. We have a chance to, to really almost eradicate it. So Steve, same question to you. And just to rephrase it, are you, do you allow yourself to be so hopeful that we can get safe enough, good enough drugs that target the right people that can get in there early enough such that we could actually effectively eliminate the disease before it starts so that the actual symptomatic Alzheimer's disease at, at some point in our future can be just a very, very rare occurrence. I don't think we're going to, to answer your question, David, I don't think we're going to eliminate Alzheimer's like polio or smallpox, where actually it's been eradicated. Okay. Um, but I think I totally agree with what Rudy just said, that I can envision treatments that are vaccines against amyloid and tau that could be given just a couple of times, perhaps together, uh, at someone either in the early accumulation stage, or as Rudy says, if we have biomarkers that can predict who is going to develop amyloid, it's just on the verge, even better, um, and then block it, we're going to make a huge impact. So you're not going to see the millions of people, and we're talking about, you know, tens of millions of people worldwide who are affected by this disease. We can knock that down substantially and also decrease the morbidity of it so that if you do get it, it's a milder form, it's later, it just has less impact. I don't think we can eradicate it, but we can make a huge difference. And then I think, you know, Rudy's hinting at oral agents. Now, that'd be great. And that's possible. So far, the ones we've tried, the beta secretase inhibitors have had problems that decrease the production of the toxic forms of amyloid into the plaques. And they've actually had worse outcomes cognitively. So we've been a little stymied there. But I think we will come up with something eventually in the oral that will be easier to administer orally that can have an impact. And I see us soon, sooner rather than later, uh, is finding combination of treatments that target, as you said, different components. Everyone has their own phenotype. So depending on what are the components of that person's illness, you can target those more specifically. And, you know, target inflammation, maybe if one of these drugs that, you know, works for diabetes um, and, and also decreases inflammation, you know, like Ozempic, something like that, um, were to be effective, there is a trial for Alzheimer's disease. That would be fantastic. And that could be a combination treatment. You know, the beta secretase inhibitors you brought up fail because of safety. Um, we had a, there was a meeting about this recently in New York, New York Academy of Sciences, and there was some consensus, including by Bob Vassar, who discovered beta secretase right. itself, that, you know, it's, it's becoming increasingly clear that, that what makes up the amyloid, the amyloid beta protein, has roles in the brain. Right. One is to help control the firing of nerve cells. The other is to act, as we showed, as a host defense peptide. So it, a lot of us think that, the, that just stopping its production was too harsh. Mm. You need some of it. So what um, my colleague, my late colleague, Steve Wagner, and I did 25 years ago was we invented something called gamma secretase modulators. Right. So to make, to make amyloid beta protein from its it's substrate protein. You need beta secretase clips, the first clip. Gamma secretase is the second clip. And the Alzheimer genes called the presenilins that cause early onset familial Alzheimer's make the gamma secretase that makes the second clip. And when they tried to inhibit that with a sledgehammer, people almost died. Same, that was really bad. Same thing. So we said, let's learn from the genetics. Let's see what the mutations in the genes for gamma secretase, the presenilins, let's see what they do. And let's just reverse that. And I won't get into the details, but by reversing that, and it took 25 years and about 
$30 million from Cure Alzheimer's Fund and the NIH to get to this point. We have a drug that acts like the Juula screwdriver. It doesn't bash the enzyme, but tweaks it and gets it to create the right forms of the amyloid beta protein that prevent amyloid formation rather than drive it. Meanwhile, you're not hitting the enzyme with a sledgehammer so you don't make people sick. So that's the drug. It took 25 years. Um, I, the, I had to start a company to develop the rest of it because to put in the uh, application to the FDA to get it into trials, they said, we want a, comp- a corporate sponsor for that. So I started a small company t- a year ago. And now we're, we're, we're waiting for the FDA to give us the approval to start our trial. We're hoping to get our first phase one safety trials going in March or April. And if those are successful, we're going to come to you, Stephen, say, let's go. Let's go in Rhode Island, my home state, and start doing the efficacy trials and treat patients. But here, what we're going to do is we want to show it can be the statin of Alzheimer's, something you take even before the brain has amyloid. And so that's going to be new for the FDA to deal with. So I hope that Rudy's drug will be successful and we'd be happy to test it if if it looks good. Uh, And whether it's that one or another one, I think we will ultimately be successful in that strategy. It's going to take some tweaks. As Rudy laid out, you know, the way has not been straightforward. We've tried with what seemed to make sense, but so far has not been. um, We haven't been able to carry it forward. But I think Rudy's strategy is good, and there will be others as well. If I can jump in with a follow-up there. So so you guys have so clearly outlined this this amyloid strategy and and how hopeful we all are in different degrees t- toward that. I wonder if you could give us now take a step back and give us a lay of the land of the of the energy that's going into the whole picture and t- into these some of these other things, the inflammation piece, the the tau tangle piece which happens later in the disease and once those are in there, you know, the, there's just real destruction happening in the brain. And whether you think so question part a of, <laughs> of the question is how much energy in proportion and money is going into those other two sectors and is it the right are they the right portions as far as you're concerned in other words is it 60 percent now going to the amyloid thing and that sounds about right and and another you know 30 to tau and another uh, what's left you know 10 percent to inflammation or or is it something else and is it right or wrong and do we need do we need to kind of rejigger that uh, those portions based on what we now, now know. Well, well, Stephen can comment on the pharmaceutical side because he's in, in, in the, as thick as anybody into the trials. But on the research side, I, I think the NIH has done a good job of dividing money between amyloid and tangles. And remember, amyloid, as it's accumulated, is making tangles pretty quickly. Um, where we were lagging was on what really causes the most nerve cell death and loss of synapses toward the, as the amyloid and tangles accumulate, which is neuroinflammation, chronic inflammation in the brain. But we didn't know what to target. And, you know, the Cure Alzheimer's Fund had, had, had funded this Alzheimer's Genome Project that I was running. And, and in 08, we found this gene called CD33 as an Alzheimer's gene. We didn't know what it was. And uh, Time Magazine called it a top 10 medical breakthrough of 08. And we were laughing because we're like, we don't even know what this gene does. Then we figured out that this gene turns on the neuroinflammation. It's the on switch. And it, and it implicated a cell in the brain called the microglial cell. And since then, we found, we and others, the royal we, have found over 60 Alzheimer genes that control microglial cells and whether they're going to cause chronic inflammation. So now we have targets for the first time, CD33, TREM2, CHIP1, et cetera, et cetera. So the pharma companies are jumping on these. And the NIH is making a big push because if you want to help a patient who's symptomatic, where the fire is blazing, you've got to put out the fire. And that fire is chronic inflammation. So I think that you have to find the targets first. And I think now we're there. So you're going to see more of an equal split in the funding. Dr. Tansy, does that mean that um, a technique like CRISPR is going to become useful in editing genes that people have? Well... You know, it's one thing to do that in sickle cell anemia, which we just saw the approvals for. It's, it's more straightforward, you know, you put it in the blood. Uh, but trying to edit all the, right, all the cells that you have to edit at once and 
do that safely without any side effects in the brain. Uh, it's a lofty goal. It's it's it, but it, it it I think it's we're we're still I still think we're pretty a few steps away from that. Uh, it'd be great, but I think we're still far away from it. I don't know. Stephen probably has an opinion on that. Well, just to answer your first question and the second question, um, there is diversification. We, we're going to need a open-minded science and discovery um, and that focuses on different components of the disease. And if you look at the pharmaceutical trials and the NIH, it is a diverse pro- portfolio. Amyloid is not the majority. Uh, you know, maybe 25 or 30 percent of the research is going toward amyloid, but there are many other targets. So inflammation is a really important target. Tau is a really important target. Aging is really important in what's called now geroscience and really understanding neuronal aging and how to increase the vitality of nerve cells uh, as we age um, and things that we can do to make that possible too, just in our daily life. Uh, so this is really critical. I'm hopeful. Um, I'm a little more excited, I think, about CRISPR maybe than Rudy just said. I thought that was a huge breakthrough to have the first approval. I don't think you can apply it broadly to all, to sporadic Alzheimer's, but I think there will be a role for uh, the genetic form, what's called autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease, to modify genes. It's a smaller segment of the population, but it's a, it could be a great proof of concept. Uh, and so I think eventually there will be treatments that are gene modifying for Alzheimer's disease. There are some, uh, certainly in other neurodegenerative diseases, there are um, uh, anti-sense drugs, uh, mRNA modifying drugs. There's one being tested now for tau uh, that looks good and has good preliminary data. We'll see how it pans out uh, in people. It's a challenge to get the concentration high enough into brain. Right now we have to deliver this medicine into the spinal canal. So if it were to work, we'd have to think about, it, it, hopefully we could get it into an intravenous form, but right now we're delivering it through a spinal tap. And so a reverse spinal tap is where we uh, put the medicine in. We'll see, but I'm, I'm hopeful. I just think we're on the right trajectory and the inflammation, as Rudy mentioned, that's critical. We're on the right t- trajectory to, to figure out how to combine treatments and how to obviously start earlier. So that was the main focus of our first part of our discussion. Do we have enough funding? We did. I mean, the last few years have been good in terms of the increased funding for Alzheimer's, but we just the new pay lines that just came out are very depressing. I don't know why it went from 25% funding for Alzheimer's uh, grants at the NIH to now the pay line says half of that. It says 10 to 12%. I hope that when the government decides how much money goes to the NIH for Alzheimer's, that they don't think the new approved drug means the job is done because, man, that's, that couldn't be farther from the truth. So I don't know what, what drove this decrease, and I would love to find out, but because, you know, it is our government, governing bodies that tell the NIH how much budget they have and what goes in. Well, if that's the case, we need to push back on that. I mean, it's been great, Sean, because funding was flat for years uh, from NIH. And then the Alzheimer's Association and others really advocated for increase and worked with Congress and advocated for increased funding. And then it quintupled, um, which has been fantastic. And the pay lines were more generous and especially for young investigators, which is great in order to attract young people into the field or people who are working in other areas of science who could bring their technique or technology to Alzheimer's research were also incentivized. So I'm sorry to hear that, uh, that there's a little backslide there because we do need that funding um, in order to you know, incentivize the breakthroughs. Um, there's no two ways about it. Yeah, the NIH pay lines just came out and uh, I was shocked, we were all shocked. Well, we gotta push back. Follow up to that without getting into the weeds of those pay lines. Let's just assume, because I'm the optimistic, most optimistic guy here, that, that that's just a mistake and lobbyists sort that out. And we get back to where we were, which was a, you know, a, a pretty impressive amount of funding. Well, it's not impressive compared to heart disease or cancer. 
On, it's on par with HIV. Okay, thank you for Clara. That's kind of where I was going. We're on par. Alzheimer's, if you think of the impact of Alzheimer's worldwide and HIV, Alzheimer's in the United States research funding is on par with HIV currently. And which is great because we were <laughs> one seventh of HIV um, for years. And uh, so that's good, but we're still way below heart disease and cancer, and the cost of Alzheimer's care is greater than heart disease or cancer. So we're not on par with the, with the magnitude of the problem. And the question I want to ask is, if, is there more research sitting there on the shelf waiting for even more funding? That is, if it was doubled again, <laughs> could you actually put that money to use tomorrow, you know, this year? Would it do... Is that the chokehold? Yeah, shots on goal, man. Trials. I mean, you know, you got to, you need, trials are expensive and you, you don't know until you try. And so um, we, we do need more smart trials that are funded and shots on goal. And so, yeah, there's more research being funded and there's more trials than before being funded. But there's lots of stuff sitting on the shelf just waiting for its chance to go into a clinical trial. Just to connect the dots, if I'm a person who's, in my late 50s, which I am, and I'm scared to death of Alzheimer's for my parents and now for, for my generation, my eventually for my kids, and I'm hearing all this promising stuff, and I'm, I'm hearing for the first time that we've got a, a theory of the case about how to stop or ex maybe slow way, way down this disease. I've got that much more incentive to speak my mind to to the, my elected officials and people who are controlling funding to say, hey, we can get here faster. The, the, the scientists are waiting to spend this money. They know how to spend it intelligently. We can stop this disease sooner if we have more money to spend on it. It's as simple as that. Is it that simple? It's not simple, but the your proposal is a good one. We should all be talking to people who make these decisions about the, import, the importance of this problem and the need for investing in research and, uh, and, and for coverage and for access. As new treatments become available, this was a big deal. I mean, we take it for granted that this first treatment, lecanemab, the one that has a full approval, is being covered by Medicare. That, wasn't, that was not a done deal. That took a lot of advocacy. So anyway, the, the point is speaking up. We all need to speak up. So I'm glad you're covering it. And I hope that your audience will speak um, to uh, their representatives. It's really important. And to insurance companies, too. I have a question about journalism for a moment. Um, I have a friend uh, whose initials are David Schenk, <laughs> who often makes the point that journalists will jump at any advance with any press release that comes from any lab and announce the end of Alzheimer's is at hand. I wonder whether there's a role in educating journalists as gatekeepers. Is there a way of educating people about how this research gets done? My experience, Sean, has been the opposite. I think that there's been a skepticism yes. among journalists, certainly with aducanumab, which was controversial. They just went to town to kill aducanumab. And there was something there. I mean, even though it wasn't done properly, uh, you know, it wasn't done optimally, um, there was some, some important information there. And they tried to kill it. And, and I've experienced more skepticism than, you know, blind optimism. Yep. So I have an experience, and I dealt with. I talked to a lot of reporters, and I'm sure Rudy has too. Yeah, they jump on bad news, and they try to make people look stupid. But they have more fun doing that because that's better clickbait than giving good news. Wow. I haven't it's something about. I'm telling you, there's a stigma, but that's what I'm saying. Getting it out of the dungeon is there's a stigma about Alzheimer's, and it's revolutionary to think that Alzheimer's is a treatable disease or preventable. That's a revolutionary concept. It is not on the journalist's uh, radar. I mean, David may be the exception who has gotten behind this, but I don't. That has not been my experience. I, I think. I think, Sean. I think both can be can be true. Um, I think that. Um, I mean, what what these guys are saying is absolutely right, and I saw the same thing. And and Rudy and I have done a little writing together to try to 
to counteract this with uh, with our with our friend Lisa Genova, who's who's just a wonderful writer on the on the topic, um, because we do need to help people understand that we've crossed this threshold and that there is some, there's some real real progress. But there also is this kind of I just see every week for the last 25 years i'm sorry these press releases come out and it makes the paper it makes some paper or some some you know internet something somewhere and people call me and say oh my goodness you see this breakthrough and i have to explain well it's an exciting thing that needs to be researched but alzheimer's is not over so I, i and i think it stems from the same problem which is as you suggest sean i think it would be incredibly useful and you and i can talk about this off air to somehow get some really wonderful journalists in a room and find a, a way to really educate them about this disease and just have them talk a little bit smarter about it. Yeah, and especially if if the esteemed researchers that we have here in this conversation are both saying we're on the verge of a whole new era, uh, it's it's time to sort of reinvent the paradigm of how you tell the story of Alzheimer's. Absolutely. So there's t- so taking both of these sides, right? Okay, the hyped up. Good news. Maybe the journalist t- made too good a news out of Lakembi, and the governing body, the U.S. government, who determines the NIH budget, said, "Oh, we're done," and maybe that's why our pay line just got, got cut in half. On the other hand, people tend to want to, you know, stop and look at an accident, right? So they get they see bad news and it embarrasses somebody and says, "Oh, all your tax dollars would go into this hypothesis that." This one person now says is wrong. How about those stupid Alzheimer researchers wasting your money? That really hurts because journalists have so much power to influencing the government who's reading the lay papers to then make decisions on the NIH pay lines. Man, we, I mean, talk about needing what you just said, uh, but will it change? Because at the end of the day, the clickbait is what makes money. So is it going to change? Yeah, I don't know. I don't want to be too pessimistic, but I think the press has done quite a bit of damage to this field. I got to have to say, I think things you say, how can things go faster? Not just more money, more clinical trials, but the press behaving as well. Yeah. Um, I have yet to ask the question about what the current new treatment costs, because I think a lot of people will immediately seize on that line of argument. But um, is the current system of sort of marketplace-driven f- pharmaceutical research, is that just a given that is never going to go away? Or is there a place for public funding of, of drug research so that a direct government funding so that um, the, the cost of a drug might be less for people being prescribed it when it becomes available? I mean, it's one thing to say you have a you have a new drug, and another thing to say, it, and it's going to cost five hundred thousand dollars. Well, this is a real challenge here because these are large molecules that were very expensive to develop. Uh, some companies have been at this for more than thirty years with no zero return, and billions of invested in R and D. Uh, and so, and. These drugs are approved for cancer and for uh, rheumatologic diseases and et cetera, monoclonal antibodies, and they're expensive. So I think it's a real challenge to roll these out. There's so many people with Alzheimer's disease to roll these out broadly. It turns out that only a percentage of people, these drugs are approved for people with early Alzheimer's disease. So symptomatically, they have mild cognitive impairment or mild dementia, and they have to meet certain criteria, certain safety criteria. So when you cone it down, it's going to turn out to be about 10% of all people that actually have early Alzheimer's disease. So we're not talking about treating everybody. But to treat a larger number of people, we're going to need drugs, and it's just going to be too expensive. We have to find other alternatives. It's just it's not cost effective to treat tens of millions of people with drugs that are this yeah. expensive. So so the, the new drug, the Kembi, is about $26,000 $26, per year. But then the patients, because they risk swelling in the brain and hemorrhage, have to have a series of MRIs while they're taking it at the IV centers. 
So I, I don't know what your Stephen probably knows the final figure better than me, but I've heard it can cost between fifty and a hundred thousand dollars per patient. Is that that right? seems a little high, but it it's expensive. Um, yeah. With the MRIs, yeah, no, I get it. Um, yeah. Well, that's a whole other thing. Is actually so we talked about this step forward, which it is. The other important point for the audience to know is that this is a very new thing for Alzheimer's disease. We have not haven't had an intravenous treatment that was clinically a, a approved. And to roll this out and with MRI monitoring and amyloid PET scans and testing for genetic risk of APOE, these are all new standards to care. And having a team to monitor it and radiologists can, that can detect the side effects, the most common side effects, which are swelling in the brain. Um, that's, that's a challenge that we're all facing. And so it's going to be, you know, difficult to roll this out and it's not cheap. Yeah. So if you go from there to the fact that there could be 10 million, up to 40 million people, if they had the blood test today, would find out they have amyloid in their brain and say, Hey, I want to get rid of it. Never mind the people who just don't want amyloid to ever get there. Um, you need small molecules, little white pills that do the same thing for a fraction of the cost at a, and with a much better safety profile. And to answer your question about public, I mean, our drug that we developed, the gamma secretase modulator, which we feel has the be one, maybe the best chance in the world to become the statin of Alzheimer's, was funded by the NIH and Cure Alzheimer's Fund. The NIH has something called a neurotherapeutics blueprint where they will fund development of your drugs and give you pharmaceutical company-like like, um, advice. So they have ex-pharma people advising you. And so all told, over the last 20 years between foundations like Cure Alzheimer's Fund and the NIH, I think about 30, over 30 million went into development of our drug. And now it's now it's finally at the FDA waiting for the, a chance to go into a, fa a safety trial next year, and um, and for there you know that it's going to cost more money now. So, uh, but the NIH even agreed to pay for the safety trial, so you know what they're doing their job. We just need more money for them to do more jobs, and if this drug works, it's it, it will be one contender, maybe the main contender, to be a safer, more affordable alternative that can be democratized across. The population. But I think there could be more, to answer your question, Sean, there are more models of public-private partnership, which Rudy is referring to, that, for example, with uh, lecanemab, there is a prevention trial for people who are cognitively normal but are building up plaques or just beginning to build up plaques, testing this amyloid-lowering drug. And it's that's a combination between the manufacturer, ASI, and Biogen, their partner, and um, the NI National Institute of Aging uh, through an Alzheimer's consortium. So there are more models of that, and there should be even more. But fundamentally, still, the pharma companies are, have the lead in drug development. They, the most of the investment comes from the pharma side. Maybe this uh, that point naturally leads to this question. I hope it does. Um, what is the role of imagination at this stage of the disease process for people like yourself who are looking at this, these advances and working on these advances, how much of the, of the, the next advance or the future is going to come from one or both of you or one of your colleagues sitting in front of a fireplace with a cup of tea, imagining what a future could look like? or imagining a therapy that might work. What, what is the role for imagination for, for you guys? I, I think imagination has to be driven, has to be seeded. Um, and so a lot of the studies that I like the best that we do, we say are agnostic, meaning you're screening for new Alzheimer genes using new algorithms, which is you know my bread and butter in my lab is uh, scanning the genome for new genes. And then when you get the new genes, most of the time you say, what the heck is that? You got to look it up. And then you have to use your imagination to say, okay, so this gene, all the statistics say, without a doubt, this is an Alzheimer's gene. 
just like when we first found that CD33 gene and didn't know what it did. And then you got to use your imagination and say, how might this gene cause a disease and how might that suggest new therapies? The second agnostic set of experiments that see the imagination is when you, without bias, screen all of the approved drugs like we just did. Like we invented Alzheimer's in a dish, the first mini human brain organoid the size of a pea that made drug screening, unbiased drug screening of all the approved known drugs in the world, a hundred times cheaper and 10 times faster than when we have to do one at a time in the past in mice. So then we get these drugs out and you're like, whoa, what the heck are these drugs? Right? I got to go to Stephen and say, what's this drug do? What's this drug do? And then you have to use your imagination and say, How, what are these drugs that are working? These drugs that are stopping tangles, that stop the amyloid, these drugs that are making the microglial cells eat the amyloid and get rid of it the way the chemistry does. And now you have to use your imagination and say, what do they have in common? And what are they teaching us about the disease? And actually, that's been the most fun I've had in the last five or 10 years in research is the imagination driven by unbiased data that comes out of agnostic screens. Uh, I mean, I, that's, that's like a, a researcher's dream. Uh, but if you just go in there with only imagination, uh, without something to see that, yeah, you, you, might, you might take a lot of wrong guesses. Well, I think if you, I think Rudy just really hit it. If you take a, uh, a team that has a solid foundation in science, that has a spirit of discovery and then has imagination to take their findings and try to see, you know, where, where can they lead and test them in an open kind of way, then get enough talented people. You're going to come up with some great stuff and stuff. There are things I think that Rudy and I have imagined, but there are things that we have not yet imagined that will become the standard of care either in our lifetime or before too long. Yeah, you got to think out of the box, but you, you have to still be a distance away where you can see the box. David Schenk, I'm going to give you the last word. Well, I'm going to step a, a, a few steps away from the box to say that, you know, uh, there's a new book called The Day After Yesterday, which is a, a book of beautiful photographs and biographies of people who suffer from Alzheimer's disease by uh, a wonderful photographer named Joe Wallace. Rudy knows him. He contributed to the book. And I was able to help a little bit too. And, um, and, and I think we've made a lot of progress in helping the world get to know people with Alzheimer's disease and really getting, getting to know, like really empathizing with, with this enormous problem that now, by now almost everyone in the world is, is touched with in some way. What we haven't done a very good job, a good enough job uh, as journalists, Sean, you and I, representing the media out there to, to, for the moment is to help the world get to know uh, the absolutely brilliant and giant hearted scientists represented here by, by, by Rudy and Steve. I happen to know, I, I knew Steve Wagner who, who, um, who worked closely with Rudy on that drug that, that he's been talking about. Never was there a sweeter, more generous, brilliant, warm person. And, and there and and there are so many others that these guys know, women and men who are who are out there, a giant army of people who have quietly brought us to this new, very, very hopeful place. And I wish there were a way for for brilliant people in the media to get to know the brilliant people in in the science world better and that they could trust each other more and maybe more maybe good ideas would come out of that but what one thing that i know would come of that is is more com better communication about what we know now what ideas we can trust how we can impart those ideas to the general public and then how we can get use those ideas to get to a cure faster david shank rudy tanzi steven soloway thank you for the conversation i'm really grateful um Good luck in 2024 and happy new year. Let's talk again. Thank you. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Thanks for having us. Dr. Stephen Salloway is founding director of the Memory and Aging Program at Butler Hospital in Providence, Rhode Island, and a professor of psychiatry and human behavior and professor of neurology at the Warren Alpert Medical School at Brown University. 
Dr. Rudy Tanzi directs the Genetics and Aging Research Unit at Massachusetts General Hospital. Director of the McCants Center for Brain Health at Mass General, Dr. Tanzi is Professor of Neurology at Harvard Medical School. And David Schenk is a national best-selling author of six books, including The Forgetting, Alzheimer's, A Portrait of an Epidemic. Late in the year 1901, right at the cusp between autumn and winter, a woman was admitted to the hospital for the mentally ill and epileptics in Frankfurt. She was seen by one of the hospital's senior physicians, Dr. Alois Alzheimer. She had a remarkable cluster of symptoms, especially remarkable because of the woman's relatively young age. She was 51 years old. Reduced comprehension and memory, aphasia, disorientation, unpredictable behavior, paranoia, auditory hallucinations, and pronounced psychosocial impairment. For the next five years, and in three hospitals, in Frankfurt, in Heidelberg, and finally in Munich, Dr. Alzheimer would document the illness of his patient, keeping a record in a blue cardboard file folder in both Latin script and in that now outdated German style of handwriting. The case history begins the morning after her admission to the hospital. 26 November 1901. She sits on the bed with a helpless expression. What is your name? Auguste. Last name? Auguste. What is your husband's name? Auguste, I think. At lunch, she eats cauliflower and pork. Asked what she is eating, she answers, spinach. In the days that would follow, Alois Alzheimer would continue to document the illness of his patient. Asked to write Augusta D, she tries to write Mrs. and forgets the rest. It is necessary to repeat every word. Amnestic writing disorder. In the evening, her spontaneous speech is full of paraphasic derailments and perseverations. patient is asked to recognize objects by touch, with her eyes closed. A toothbrush, sponge, bread, spoon, brush, glass, knife, fork, plate, purse, mark, cigar, key. She recognizes them quickly and correctly. By touch, she calls a brass cup, a milk jug a teaspoon. But when she opens her eyes, she immediately says, a cup. When she has to write, Mrs. Augusta D, she writes Mrs. And we must repeat the other words because she forgets them. The patient is not able to progress in writing and repeats, I have lost myself. I have lost myself. August Dieter died in April of 1906. The cause of her death was septicemia, blood poisoning that resulted from bed sores. Dr. Alzheimer has to be given custody of her medical record and of her brain, which he studied. He'd go on to describe for the very first time the tangles and plaques that are the anatomical hallmarks of the disease that bears his name today. His drawings of those details of August Dieter's brain, the woman who told him she had lost herself, 
are hauntingly prescient. The precise significance of those plaques and tangles could not have been understood in 1906. And yet, Alzheimer's detailed drawings of what he saw under the microscope tell us he somehow grasped their importance in that pathology lab in Munich at the beginning of the last century. Today, even as we come to a greater and greater understanding of the significance of those plaques and tangles, we can say that the days of people losing themselves to Alzheimer's disease, to families loving someone who appears to have forgotten their life, the end of those days, the end of Alzheimer's, may be very near. The Hear Me Now podcast is a production of the Providence Health System and its family of organizations. We invite you to subscribe at hearmenowpodcast.org. The program is produced by Scott Acord and Melody Fawcett. We have research help from medical library staff Basha Dolovska Elliott, Sarah Viscuso, Carrie Grinstead, and Heather Martin. The entries from Alois Alzheimer's clinical notes were read by Thomas Barclay. Our theme music was written by Roger Neal. The executive producer is Michael Drummond. Join us in two weeks when we'll be looking ahead in 2024 and asking a panel of clinicians about what they're expecting in their fields in the year ahead. It's a way for us to focus our attention at the beginning of the year on the increasingly complex world that makes up medicine in the 21st century. I'm Sean Collins. Thanks for listening this year. Be well.